tonight a Boris Johnson exclusive. He spills the beans on life inside number 10 in his most candid interview since stepping down. Here we go, Nadine. Hey. Hello, how are you? Nice to see you. <laughs> Why Keir Starmer, also known as Mr Snoozefest, has no chance of winning an election. Sir Crasheruni Snoozefest, he thinks that he's going to get people to to vote Labour just by standing there. And the, shall we say, unusual thing he's been ending up to since leaving office. I'm, I've got a project which is to to master the, the form of the cup. All of that in the next hour. Good evening, I'm Nadine Dorries and welcome to the first ever Friday Night with Nadine. Joining me is former Whitehall editor at the Financial Times, Sebastian Payne, who wrote The Fall of Boris Johnson. Times Radio's political correspondent, Charlotte Ivers, and former Labour advisor, Scarlett Maguire, who's worked alongside four of its former leaders. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for being on the show this evening. Good evening. Thank you it's for having us. Yes. It's a pleasure to have you. It will be a pleasure to be here. Are you looking forward to it? As excited as you are, I think. <laughs> Without further delay, let's crack on with my interview with the, my friend and former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. He started by telling me about his life after Downey Street. So, what's it like being at home with the kids? Are they seeing more of Dad? They are, yes, and it's fantastic because, you know, I've got, I've got a very full... Day, I'm doing lots of uh, writing and yeah, I wasn't implying that you were. But, uh, but, 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 but yeah, well, <laughs> want you want to be clear about that? Unless I specifically tell you otherwise, I'm doing stuff in you know for my for Uxbridge and and uh, doing a lot of a lot of a lot of political work. But yeah, it means I can do reading. I can do to them. Building things is great. Building what? I was building a, 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 a garage for the quad bike. I mean, oh. not, not a big quad, it was a miniature quad bike. Yeah, yeah. I don't, they're, they're Fantastic. Too, they're too small for quad Boris may now have more time for his family, but he's still focusing his political energy to supporting Ukraine. He's helped with sending N-laws and tanks, but says the UK still needs to provide more firepower. You're welcome. Oh, you. oh, very, very good. Let's talk about Ukraine, because I know that's really important to you. After three tumultuous years in power, you described yourself as a foot soldier and a spear carrier to Zelensky. Is that how you see yourself? Yeah, I think the the job that I can most usefully do for the Ukrainians is to get over to people the kind of suffering that they're still experiencing and to emphasise how vital it is that we accelerate the military support that we are giving. I mean, I went to Ukraine a few days ago and I saw the continuing barbarism of... What Putin is doing. You just, I, I went out like, like so many others have done, but it was incredible to see it for myself. I, I saw blocks of flats that had been obliterated by 500 kilo bombs of no conceivable military value to Putin. He does it purely as an act of, of terrorism. This is still going on, uh, you know, across the, the front line. He's continuing to, to wipe out uh, towns. He's absolutely merciless. He has no respect for the laws of war, uh, human life. So we have to give them the kit they need to fight them off and to, uh, to send Putin back whence he came. And that means a, a lot of weaponry. And that, so, the, so I was making the case last week for, for the tanks. And I'm delighted to say that the British government, once again, is, is, sending the, the, is in the lead in sending... Uh, tanks to, to Ukraine. They're going to need about 300 tanks, so we need a big international effort. So obviously the US and Germany and other countries were listening to you because they, as a result of a powerful article, I don't know if it's a result of a powerful article you wrote, but you wrote about that. It followed, it followed a powerful, I, I don't know whether it was post hoc, ergo propter hoc. It was, as, as we say, it was, it happened, they, they, it happened to, to, my article came, then, then, you know, the, the, the Germans have said that they're lifting the, uh, the ban on export of, of the leopard tanks. The Americans are giving tanks.
But, you know, I'm not saying anything to do with my uncle. The, the key thing is that other countries have got to do the same. And, you know, I'll tell you this, Nadine, I think it wouldn't be a bad thing if we gave some more tanks ourselves. Well, I was going to ask and... you that. What else do we need to do? What else can the West do? Well, I mean, they've they... got the tanks. You wrote that very powerful article, which I'll talk about in a moment. They've got the tanks now. What else do the West need to do? So what they need, uh, what the Ukrainians need, is they, they, they need longer-range artillery to hit Putin's command and control, uh, his ammo dumps. I mean, they can see what Putin is doing on their territory, right? It's on Ukraine territory, but they can't hit it. So they just need longer-range artillery of the kind that, uh, that we have and we're looking at what we can do, certainly what the Americans uh, can help them with. They also need armoured vehicles. They need planes. Uh, they need high-speed planes in order to take out some of these uh, Russian uh, targets in, in, in Ukraine. And they need tanks. So they've got a pretty long shopping list, but they can do it. And they have proved they can do it. And I think that's what's been so stunning about the Ukrainians. They have shown such fantastic bravery. Give them the kit and they will do it. The faster Ukraine wins, the better for the world economy, the more lives we save, the more Russian lives are saved. I mean, this is a disaster for Russia as well. So let's get it done. OK, so can I take, can I speak the unspeakable, take yeah. you to a place which is unthinkable? What if Ukraine don't win? What if Putin does succeed? What will be those, what will be the reaction of the Western world to that? What will be those conversations that will take place between Western leaders? I think it is unthinkable and I don't think it's going to happen. I think that this is a war of independence now and wars of independence only end one way. The Ukrainians are fighting for their country. They're fighting for their land, their hearths and homes, their families. And that gives them the most fantastic moral energy, which the, the Russian soldiers don't have. The Russian soldiers, it's a, it's a conscript army. Uh, they're, they're poor uh, people from ethnic minorities in some remote parts of, of Russia who are being dragooned out there to fight, fed into the, the mincer of Putin's uh, war machine. It's a disaster for, for them. And it's, it's clear to me that this will only end one way. It just needs to end as fast as, uh, as possible. Now, people say, look, we mustn't escalate. We, must, we mustn't do things that will provoke Putin, right? If, you, if, you give him, if, you, if we send tanks to Ukraine, if we send more NATO-compatible weaponry to, to Ukraine, we'll provoke the Russians. I would just say to those people, really? I mean, how more, what more could Putin do? He's already... Pulverizing, sure pulverizing civilians in uh, completely innocent centers of population. But how sure are you that he won't press that nuclear button? And so that is what people say. It's certainly what Putin likes to, to talk about. But I just think it is absolutely vanishingly unlikely that any such thing will happen. And all sorts of, uh, all sorts of reasons. Uh, first of all, he would immediately lose any support from China, uh, from all the, the middle ground countries who've frankly been cutting him too much slack. So uh, people in, in India, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, there's been a lot of people who've been giving Putin the benefit of that. You use a nuclear weapon, that's over. So he loses all that support. Secondly, he puts Russia, his population, into a state of complete cryogenic economic uh, deep freeze. You know, they are, they are, what, the sanctions that we currently have on would be nothing compared to what the Russians would suffer. The third thing is, I think he'd terrify... But if he's he did, if mad. He did, if he's he did, mad. Well, he's, he wants, he's a politician. Does he think he in did, that logical way? You're thinking logically I that think the, the economic I think he, impact and the sanctions... I think he Is does. he thinking in that he, way? Look, he wants, to, he, wants to, he wants to succeed, right? And if he does that, he will so terrify his own population uh, who will think that they are, who knows what reprisals they could face, and to say nothing of the economic reprisals, he will lose his own population as well. And the other thing is, which people, you know, when you look at what a, what a nuclear, tactical battlefield nuclear weapon could involve, he wouldn't stop the Ukrainians. And they would fight on, right? So, you know, in practical terms, it wouldn't make that much difference on the battlefield. He would simply forfeit uh, any hope of 
uh, keeping any opinion on his side anywhere in the world. It would be a disaster for him. So he's not going to do that. But fundamentally, here's what I would say. It's not our job to worry about what happens to Putin. We've got to stop focusing on Putin and focus on the Ukrainians. They are heroic people. They've been fighting like absolute... Uh, with all the, the heart and courage of a lion. They've been fighting like lions. And, and they, are, they are going to win. We should focus on supporting them. And that, that is how to do this. So can I just ask you one last question on Ukraine? And that's about your relationship with Zelensky, which is obviously of mutual respect. And you guys have a bond. And what would you say was at the root of that bond? You know, I, I, I read that you were talking about, you know, you'd, you'd seen the graves, you'd, you'd heard all about the, the rapes, the mass murders, and many of those murders have been of children. Is it being fathers? Is it, is it your no, basic...? I think, it's, I think it's very simple. I think it's... Look, I was lucky to, to meet Volodymyr Zelensky very early on in his time. Uh, he came to London, we, we, had, we got on very well. But it's the fundamental thing is that the UK just saw it very clearly and very early. And we saw that it was absolutely black and white. It was good well, and Well, you evil. saw. It I know was, people are right advising and, you against getting involved so early. So you saw well, that you needed to get involved quite early on. I, th I think, yeah, look, I mean, there was a discussion about whether or not to give the, the end laws the, the shoulder-launched... And you results. were absolutely determined... Yeah, and so would. was Ben Wallace. Yeah, Ben was uh, too. Ben was... Abs and you were, you were in the discussions in Cabinet. You will remember them, Nads. You will remember but them. But not all. everybody was, and the no, advice wasn't cabinet necessarily was, Cabinet was way. solid. I think, I, yeah, look, there are always going to be cautious voices, and there were a lot of people who were worried about this escalation point. This, you know, if you send the... the so before we did it, in, in uh, 2021, when we were discussing it, people were saying, well, if you do this, it will provoke Putin... He was going to do it anyway. Yeah. It was totally right. When those end laws... And they're saying the same thing now. That was the advice then. If you provide the end laws, you're going to provoke Putin. The advice is the same now. That, and that's why it's so important to get over uh, that, that if, if you want peace, which I do, then you've got to help the Ukrainians win as fast as possible. So I covered a lot of ground there. So, Sebastian, he's being very modest in the impact that he's had in persuading others to send more arms to Ukraine. Do you think he will do more on that? Do you think people are listening to him? I think so. And whatever happens to Boris Johnson next, I think Ukraine is such a big part of his political standing and will always be a part of his political legacy. And since he left Downing Street, he's clearly gone all around the world to try and sell this message. He's obviously been to Ukraine recently to see Vladimir Zelensky. And I think even since your interview, Nidian, he's been to the US and he's been spotted on Capitol Hill with the Speaker, um, with many of the senior Republicans who are more sceptical about sending money to Ukraine. And I think Boris has actually been very outspoken of saying to these Republicans, this is a battle beyond um, just, you know, arms and one thing. It's about liberal democracy. It's about the values we stand for and trying to appeal to them in a more in a different way than more as practical weapons. So I think he does have that voice. And you did highlight a very good point in that interview. At the very beginning, when this happened, about this time last year, the, the Russian invasion, there was so much pushback from the kind of Whitehall group thing about saying, oh, you don't want to prod the Russian bear. It could go very badly. And he pushed against that. And I think he does deserve a lot of credit. He did. And Char Scarlett, would you agree with that? That. He did. He did lead the world in coalescing the Western leaders. Do you think he gets the credit he deserves for doing? Yeah. That? No. I think. I think he's got a lot of credit. I mean, I, I think this is sort of Boris channeling his Churchill. Right? Is that he's been looking for the Churchill thing, and 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 actually, it's sort of the flip side of Nazi Germany is Ukraine, and he's found it, and he's going to go on mining that. What worries me is that it's all about, you know, we're going we're gonna to win, we're going to do this, we're going to do... And actually, it's not about what is our end game, which is very boring. I mean, Boris is sunny uplands. He's not about well, how do we compromise. That's, that's an important point, Charlotte, because he actually rules out the unthinkable, which is a Putin victory. Those sunny uplands, that optimism, do you think that's important? I think it's possibly something that's valuable for Boris Johnson to be going around saying now that he is no longer in government. I think for those in government, obviously, they can't just talk about that. They have to be thinking about all the different contingencies, about the possibility that things do go badly wrong. It's interesting, actually. I'm really intrigued by Scarlett talking about Churchill there because 
in a way, yes, this is Boris Johnson finding his Churchill moment, but he actually had another global crisis. He had coronavirus, and he didn't look like Churchill in that moment, I thought. He clearly didn't enjoy particularly being Mr. Bad News, whereas somehow the wartime leader suits him an awful lot better than the pandemic leader. Well, you know, Michelle, we'll come back to that. But now, coming up, Boris reveals what he makes of his successor. Is Rishi some kind of out-of-control maverick, do you think? Nancy, look, uh, uh... <laughs> Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. You're watching my first ever show and exclusive interview with Boris Johnson. He opened up about Partygate, Rishi Sunak and opposition leader, so Keir Starmer, or as Boris calls him, Crasheruni Snoozefest. I know you, and I know you are the very last person ever who would willingly, without being dragged there, go to a party. Boris, I know you're not going to like me saying this, but you're not actually big on the small talk and parties. And you're the last person who would be oh. at one. Do you think it was wrong? Oh, sorry, but, but you're not. You're just not a party animal. Right. Do you? I'll take you from you, Nadine. Do you... <laughs> OK, all right. So, do you think it was wrong of you to focus all your attention on making sure we made the vaccine, we delivered the vaccine, we were the, one of the first countries to live restrictions, or do you think you should be prowling the corridors of 10 Downing Street in that warren of officers checking up on 250 employees and asking them what they were doing on the Friday nights with you no, and look, Jackers? Look, I, what I, there's a, there's a, as you know, there's a, a, a parliamentary committee looking into some as aspects of this. I'd better be... You know, of course, respectful of, of them, uh, but I just repeat what I've what I've said before, and I hope is obvious to everybody that you know anybody who thinks I was knowingly going to to parties uh, that were breaking lockdown rules in in Number Ten, or and uh, then knowingly covering up uh, parties that were illicit, that were other people going to you know, that, that's all, that's all strictly for the birds. If, people, if anybody thinks that they're they're out of their mind, I've got to wait for this thing to to conclude and um, what I would say is that we all thought what, what we were doing or certainly I thought what we were doing was within the rules and what we certainly thought was we are working blindingly hard on um, some massive priorities for, for the country so what we were doing was getting that vaccine rollout organised we were thinking desperately about how to you know, it went through lots of phases, how to ramp up testing and and all the rest of it. I mean, it seems, thank goodness, that era is is, yes, yeah. is behind us. But one thing I would, you know, one thing people forget, um, well, let's pray it's behind us, but one thing people forget when I think about the, the vaccine rollout is, you know, we've got the, I think it's the third anniversary of, of Brexit coming up or the, th the third anniversary of the day when we actually came out of the, the EU. And you, you don't hear it much these days, but it is absolutely the case that um, had it not been for our ability to do our own regulation, had it not been for the fact that uh, we come out of the, the European Medicines Agency and the MHRA, uh, the, the Medical Health Regulation Agency, was now totally free to decide how fast to, to approve a, a vaccine. We wouldn't have been able to do that vaccine rollout so fast. And, you know, I, I, it, it is literally true that Brexit helped save lives. And, you know, people's eyes, you know, bulge a bit when you say that. But it, it happens to be true. And it's something it's, we it's, didn't and hear and a lot at the time. And, and, it's, and, and, it, yeah. and it, so it's... Um, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of all the work that those, those, those people did. So you and Rishi are both fined. He lived in a flat above number 10. You lived above number 11. And he's been fined again now. Is Rishi some kind of out-of-control maverick, do you think? Nads, look, <laughs> uh, uh, let me be very clear. Uh, the, let me, as, as, politi as politicians say, when the, the fact is that the Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. And Can we? Uh, yes, Labour are 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the polls. No, no. Can Come we on. win the next Come election? On. We've got about... Let me get this right. We've got... Well, we're, we're in a almost, worse we've almost two years than to, 97 we've today. Two, we've got almost two years to, to go before there has to be an election. I mean, I think you, you, you don't have to have an election until January 
25. So that's, 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 that's almost two years. And but we're not going to. We're uh, not going to go to January well, 25, are we? I, it is, you talk about 97. I, I remember 97. I fought that. Did you fight the 97? You didn't. You're far too young to I was running a campaign. I was yeah, but I, I, OK, well, you're far too young to fought I'm older than you. you. <laughs> I fought the 97 election. I was there, uh, and I remember what it was like. And it was, it was really, really tough. And you had... Um, uh, you know, I, I just feel that you could feel this, this movement of voters actively who wanted... Tony Blair. Uh, and that is just not happening now. I don't feel it. I don't... I, 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 oh, the Sakrasharuni snooze fest, the human bollard, you know, Keir Starmer, that is. He thinks that he's going to get people to, to vote Labour just by standing there and, and doing... It's not going to happen. We, or, the economy will start to improve, inflation will come down, people will reward the Conservative Party, they'll reward the government for being sensible, for cutting their taxes and, and for getting things done that they need done, fixing the things that Rishi has said that he's, that he's going to fix. And never forget, when it comes to it, when it comes to it, it's going to be a very clear choice. Do you want the, the Conservatives, who are going to manage the economy, simply not put taxes up any further, in fact, cut taxes? I mean, we've, of course, the taxation situation has been very, very difficult because of COVID. The huge expense that we had to go to, $480 billion we had to spend on looking after people during COVID. It was massively expensive. It had a big fiscal impact. But Labour, everything they say makes it perfectly obvious that the taxes would be even higher. They're, they're not in a position to control the unions because they're actually funded by the unions. I think that you'd have a very interesting situation. They, they would be um, gravitationally sucked back into the orbit of the EU. And I think that'd be very wrong for the country. It would lose us a lot of opportunities that we currently, uh, that we currently have. The, the final point, this is a very tense time internationally and people want the UK to be strong. And, you know, we've talked a bit about what the UK has done on Ukraine. And I do think that the UK has been absolutely indispensable in helping to fortify the West and to give the Ukrainians the, the support they need. Will that happen? Would, would you have a, a, a robust, strong UK uh, under a Labour party when you have eight of the shadow front bench, including the shadow foreign secretary, David Lammy, who actually, you talk about Putin waving the nuclear uh, weapon, eight of them have voted to get rid of our independent nuclear weapon. And, and would you have a, a, a government that really st stood up for our armed forces, Nadine, when Lisa Nandy, who I'm sure has some role on the Labour front bench, I can't remember exactly what it is now, uh, but she has said she wants to get rid of our armed services in favour of a, of a gender-neutral security agency or something. So, look, all I'm saying... She's sa levelling up, Secretary. Thank you, sorry. How it's do you okay. know that? <laughs> you can't be <laughs> clever, obviously. Just know some things. <laughs> so it's a very rare occasion when I know something that Boris Johnson doesn't. So, coming up... From Brexit to bovines, we've got more from my exclusive interview with Boris and reaction from my guest right after the break. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. Still with me is Sebastian Payne, Charlotte Ivers and Scarlett Maguire. So let's talk about Boris's comments on Ukraine. We discussed the fact that there were advisers who were reluctant to send support. So, and that wasn't just in this country, that was a global issue. It was kind of the, the, uh, the perceived wisdom was, don't poke the Putin bear. We don't know how he will react. So Charlotte, was he right? You know, we know he marshaled the world leaders. Was he right to do that? Well, I was fascinated by the brief moment there where you and Boris Johnson had a slightly different view on what was said in Cabinet and how much agreement there was. But I, I know I can't push you on that because you will tell me collective responsibility means you can't tell the likes of me. But I think he was. He got the calls right on Ukraine. He has rightly recognised that. And actually, it's not the only thing he did right. Over the course of his premiership, he very much delivered what he said he'd deliver, which was getting Brexit done. He got the vaccine rollout right. And then he's not prime minister anymore. And it fascinates me because he clearly had all of these errors 
that fundamentally often weren't about public policy. They were about who he is, who the people around him were as people. And I wonder if he ever kicks himself at night thinking, could things have been different? And I sort of think, no, they couldn't, because it all came down to the very core of Boris Johnson's personality in the end. So I wouldn't agree with you there. I think it came down to the core of the people who were around him, not down to Boris Johnson, who was very much, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, as, as people who are in Whitehall, you've heard him, right, come on, let's go, let's, let's deliver. He was very much an inspirational push forward. And you're right, he did deliver the vaccine and he sent the troops into, you get the end laws into Ukraine. So, Scarlett, do you think that, do you think harnessing the world leaders in the way that, I mean, he was right out there, you know, that phone call, Biden saying, I think it was, OK, buddy, we're right behind you. That, that whole process of him getting everyone, Macron, everyone, to, to send aid to Ukraine, do you think it was the right thing to do? Yeah, but I think we have to remember the absolute shock of, of, of most people when Putin invaded Ukraine. Is, is it have been... I mean, you know, with hindsight, we could we can see it all. But actually, many, many people thought, no, you know, he's just he's just playing games. He's just and that shock and the complete this is he's crossed the line. It's over. We've got to protect Ukraine. So actually, by that time, Boris was was pushing at an open door. Right. I mean, as far as the vaccines are concerned, it's quite interesting what he says about Brexit, because I was thinking, hmm. So how come our death rate was worse than France and Germany, right? It's, it's not that we did well. And the other thing about the vaccines is, I mean, you know, I remember when I went to get my vaccination and it was full of volunteers being incredible and volunteers working for no money. And in the meantime, you know, you had these dreadful people sort of making millions out of PPE quite often that didn't work. So I, I think all of it has on the one hand and on the other throughout that time, actually. So nothing's ever perfect, but, you know, we didn't have the worst death rate and we are an island with 65 million people and there were, it's a very complex um, a way of measuring death rates from country to country. So it, it's not that we had the worst death rate. We did have the, the first to have a vaccine. And, you know, Boris did ensure that we were the first country both to produce the vaccine and to get a vaccine into someone's arm. But you're right, you know, all this is weighed up against what else was going on that wasn't so perfect. Mm. So, Sebastian, you know, much of this is about the media's uh, reporting, perception, uh, the, the way it's presented to the public. There was so much going on that was good and right. First country to produce the vaccine, to administer the vaccine. We did so well in the first country to lift restrictions. But, of course, the media has to look for all the bad as well. Do you think that in the heat of the COVID moment that perhaps what we needed was just a little bit more that was inspirational and a bit more that was there to, to look at what was happening that was good and be proud of who we were in leading the world in COVID vaccination. Look, I think it was a very feverish time for the whole country, for politicians and for the media. And, that you know, obviously, I think, as Scarlett was saying, there are some things that went well, some things that didn't go well. And what's very interesting is if you look at the opinion polling about how Britons look back on the COVID pandemic, many of them actually say, look, OK, the beginning didn't go so well. There were mistakes made in terms of when we went into lockdown and testing and PPE. But the COVID vaccination is the reason most people look back and think that the government kind of did OK on that. Mm -hmm. And I do think, actually, when you look back on it, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine, we were the first country to get those jabs into arms. We rolled out the Pfizer vaccine very well. That was a kind of a big triumph. And what connects these two things to him, it's interesting about Mr Johnson's period is the COVID vaccination and Ukraine are two things he did very well. And there's this big unanswered question about why that wasn't transferable to other parts and obviously getting breaks over the line. But I think there is a big question about why this didn't transfer to other parts of his leadership because those were massive things in his three years in Downing Street. Oh, come on, COVID took up two years of it. It did take up two years of it, but there's a lot of other things as well, day-to-day -day things that didn't go so well that obviously contributed to those final times there. And I just think it's a fascinating point because when we were talking about Ukraine, Boris was so engaged with that, with the vaccine rollout. He was really engaged with that. The other areas, it didn't quite go so well. And to your point about the media and how that was all covered, look, obviously, you know, when you're doing political journalism, you're trying to make your best guess at one story at any one time. You can't always get everything right. And journalists know probably about half of what politicians know. So we are sort of, in a way, going down dark... Half? 
We try for half. <laughs> We're going down an, a dark corridor with open razor blades is how I think about it. Wow. So when you're doing that, you're not going to get everything right. Same with politicians. Thank you all. Boris also lifted the lid on why Keir Starmer, who he called Mr Snoozefest, has absolutely no chance of winning an election. Let's take a listen. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. And Can we? Uh, yes, Labour are 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the no, polls. No, no. Can Come we on. win the next Come election? On. We've got about... Let me get this right. We've got... Well, we're, year, we're in a almost, worse we've got almost position two years than to, 97 we've got almost today. Two, we've got almost two years to, to go. Sir Crasheroonie, snooze fest, the human bollard, you know, Keir Starmer, that is, he thinks that he's going to get people to, to vote Labour just by standing there and, and doing... That. It's not going to happen. We, or, the economy will start to improve, inflation will come down, people will reward the Conservative Party, they'll reward the government for being sensible. So, Scarlett. Yes. Mr Snoozefest, I mean, can he win the next election? Yeah, I mean, look, this, this is terribly reminiscent, you and I might remember it, of 96, 97. And, and it's the... not, though, because the public loved Tony Blair. They don't love Keir Starmer. No, but what is, what is very reminiscent is the Tories being in a, a free fall down. I mean, they were never this far apart. I mean, the polls, the polls are literally unbelievable. I do not think that if we had a general election tomorrow, that that's would what would happen. But actually, I mean, I, heard, I remember in 96, people talking like Boris, oh, the, 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 uh, the economy will come good and we'll be recognised. Actually, the economy did come good. I mean, Labour went in with Ken Clark's economy and they, they, they managed to have money to spend. I'm not so sure it's going to happen this time. It's certainly what the economists don't think. But, but, but I think that, that the, the people are tired. They are tired. It's sleaze. It's incompetence. I mean, you know, the levelling up, all the people in the red wall seats are going, but what's happened? Where is it? Where are the factories that we thought we'd get after Brexit? Whereas, I mean, I, I think that, that, that actually the problem isn't Keir, who actually I, I think is rather good and gets better all the time. The problem is that, that, that people have stopped believing the Conservatives. But, you know, Scarlett, in 96, 97, I ran a campaign, as I said, and the public absolutely hated us. They hated the Conservatives and they loved Tony Blair. None of that, you look at the polls, but none of that is out there on the streets. If you go out campaigning on Saturday as a Conservative, you don't get spat at when you knock on someone's door, which is exactly what happened in 97. It's not the same. The polls are, as you say, polls apart, but it's not the same out there. The feeling out there isn't Labour going to win and Conservatives are going to lose. I just, I just, I just think... It's one thing after another. And, and you have Rishi Sunak is being painted into a corner. It's very interesting. Boris Johnson did not say one nice thing about it. He didn't mention him, right? Clearly, what Boris Johnson wants to happen is that he comes back and leads the Conservatives into a, a winning election. I don't think this is going to happen, but that's, that's his plan. But as long as you've got Rishi Sunak in there, actually you've got somebody who might have a massive majority, but is so weak that he can't deal with his own party and has rebellions all the time. And, and those of us on the sidelines who are just watching it in the country are just saying, what is going on? And, you know, you talk about getting Brexit done. We aren't near it, right? And we haven't yet... Whatever benefits were supposed to happen have not happened yet. Charlotte, quickly, did you want to comment on whether you think Mr Snoozefest can win? <laughs> I think the polls look terrible for the Conservatives. I think there's maybe a small chance that they could turn things around. I think, to be honest, they are going to really, really struggle. And actually, what Scarlett was saying there about the situation in Parliament really drove home for me something that a lot of Conservative MPs have said to me recently, which is many of them don't think they're going to win. Many of them really, to be honest, are starting to give up. And the minute that a party starts to give up and loses the will to govern, then it is game over, I think. That How old were you, Charlotte, in 97? I was, I was two years old in 97. <laughs> <laughs> I told Boris that Rishi is like a submarine prime minister and has been hiding away. Well, interestingly, since the trailers went out for this programme, his ears must have been burning because he popped up last night to do an interview with our very own Piers Morgan. 
Piers grilled the Prime Minister on two key election issues, migrants and the NHS. Oh, no, that's not Rishi. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny, everyone. <laughs> Here's the right clip. <laughs> I don't think the current situation is fair. Right? People coming here illegally, it's not fair on those who are working hard, paying taxes, relying on public services. It's not fair on those who migrate here legally and follow all the rules. And it's actually not fair on those who desperately need our help from around the world and we're not in a position to be able to help them because of what's happening. So for all those reasons, we, we need to fix this. Do you not feel this duty that you talked about to actually take care of nurses and say, actually, we do have to make some exceptions and at top of my list, my priority is going to be nurses and give them a proper pay rise. You know, you're, you're right, nurses should be an exception. And that's because they do an incredible job for all of us and they demonstrated that during the pandemic and I'm really grateful to them for that. And you're right, I grew up in an NHS family, so this does burn deeply inside of me because I know how important great healthcare is for people. So that's the crew having a first night joke. So, Charlotte, what did you think of that clip of Rishi? Well, it reminded me rather of the clip of Boris Johnson talking about all the things he considers wrong with Keir Starmer. And he talked about Keir Starmer not being able to control the unions and Keir Starmer putting up our taxes. And looking at Rishi Sunak there talking about nurses, I thought, well, he doesn't seem to be doing a fantastic job of fixing the strikes. And frankly, my taxes are pretty high at the moment and I don't see them coming down any time in the near future. And I think that maybe will be another problem that Sunak faces going into the next election. All of the attack lines that he was using and Boris Johnson used in that clip we saw are things that can be thrown back at him. Yeah, well, Rishi was Chancellor for two years. Well, you know, cabinet decisions are collective three responsibility. Three years, three years, I think. Collective yeah. responsibility in the cabinet, of course. So all cabinet ministers are responsible for what happened under the Boris Johnson government. Yes, absolutely. Seb? I think the thing about nurses' pay is that obviously the government is desperate to try and do a deal and solve this and just get the strikes out of the headlines. And we've had lots of reports of them making progress with the rail unions, but we still haven't seen that yet. There was allegedly progress with health unions. We still haven't seen that yet. If they want to have this year-long period of just governing in a calm way, then they're going to have to try and get the strike sorted. But as you heard from the Prime Minister there, <coughs> he's not really particularly wanting to budge and he's sticking to the line that inflation is the number one thing that needs to be solved. So, still to come, find out why Boris is so obsessed with the back of a cow. Yes, really. And what movie really makes him laugh? I laugh so much that I almost black out. Welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. Um, surprise number two tonight. The producer has brought a bottle of wine onto the set. Um, they obviously know more than I do. So let's move it swiftly on. We've heard his thoughts on Ukraine, Brexit, Labour and the future of the Conservatives under Rishi. But what does Boris do to unwind? It might not be what you think, but let's have a listen. I Something I know about you that other oh, people don't God. know is that you're a big fan of Peter Sellers. So, what is your favourite Peter Sellers film or scene or... What is it about Peter Sellers? Peter, that well, OK, well, these are very unfashionable. It is unfashionable. I, it is totally unfashionable. I find, I find the, the Pink Panther films almost sort of, um, you know, I, 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 I laugh so much that I, I almost black out. And, me too. Um, so you know, the, but I, I, I watch it. My, my, my some of my older children, they, would, they love it too. They love it too. I, but but who was I watching it with? My children. My children. Love it. Some some people are just absolutely kind of stony faced about this. And and anyway. Can you do a Clouseau impersonation? I think it'd be very wrong. I'm not gonna, but uh, what I do, what I, Go what, on. What I, no, 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 no. This is not. This is not the not the time, Kato. Um, <laughs> what, what I what I like is. Um, I, I do like the 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 thing when when Cluzo Cluzo gets his manservant Cato to test his reflexes by I often I often I often think about how to organise that and, uh, and I sometimes think I think I should get my executive assistant Anne Sindel uh, you know, to, to, <laughs> to, to get a baton on you and push me. <laughs> 
Cato! Release me, you fool! Oh. Inspector Clouseau's residence. In a telephone, you idiot. Those are great films. Boris, how'd you chill out? I paint and I draw very, very badly. I'm trying to... I'm I've tr seen your paint, George. No, no, no. You do draw very well. I love, I love paint. I'm trying to... I'm trying to I've got... I'm try, at the moment, I'm, I've got a project, which is to, to master the, the form of the cow. So the cow... <laughs> <laughs> Cows are actually far more difficult to to draw than you uh, than, than than you think. How many how many toes on the, the front does a cow have? Four. No, it's, it's how many two, is it? It's two. Two. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and they've got a little thing on the heel, uh, and 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 uh, um, what do you call what do you call that bit of the cow? I have no idea. It's called the, I think it's called the, the withers. Uh, what do you call what do you call the the, the, the bit the back of the knee of the cow? The back of the knee? No, the hock. The hock. Okay. You got anyway. <laughs> the, the, it, it's if it, they, they they repay a lot of study, and so I've got a I'm filling a book now with cow drawings. Pictures of a cow. Pictures of parts of a cow, and and a lot of whole cows and. Some... <laughs> you're spending, <laughs> but it's, but one, you're spending my, too my, much my, time my, in the my country. Object, my objective is to master the cow. Okay. And I'm getting there. Good. I'm glad to hear that. The next stop, the horse. After that. That'd be more difficult. No, no. No, the horse, the horse is not there. No. So if you're stuck in the lift, who would you rather be stuck in the lift with? Keir Starmer or Nicola Sturgeon? Oh, brother. Um, uh, I th you know. Um, well, actually, it, you know, it's like all these things. And I'm sure the viewers would, would understand this. Both individuals are actually far nicer and more amusing than you than you might otherwise imagine and you know the the kind of hostility that you see between politicians um on screen is 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 often not reflected in in real life um i think provided it was a really you know provided it wasn't like 50 floors i, I wouldn't mind either <laughs> so what's your death row meal my death row meal, meal yeah uh, you gotta be careful you gotta get this right it's always got to be the same answer Tony Blair always used to give different answers. I think it's bangers and mash, isn't it? Oh, that's it's, a good one. I think bangers, mash and red With wine. With gravy? Yes, why not gravy, yes. Can you cook? I can cook bangers and mash and gravy, definitely, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. OK. Is that, is that, have I passed? OK. I think you've passed. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me on your, your show. My first Nadine, show. Nadine, your first show, and, and good luck with it. I nearly wet myself then. It was going to be great. terrifying. <laughs> Don't clip that out. <laughs> Listening to that were my panel, Sebastian, Charlotte and Scarlett. So, in homage to his new hobby, could you three whip up... Can you draw cows? Could you three whip up a, an image of a cow and your stationery always? OK. This is... Okay. This, is <laughs> this is really mean. <laughs> this Who is, remembers this music? This is, to, this is Tony Hart. That was... Vision on. I feel like that was performance art, just watching... Boris Johnson describing his cows. That could, oh, so, this looks like a wolf. Seb, did anything surprise you about his hobbies or...? I mean, when he very famously drew buses, <laughs> was his... Well, made buses, oh, it looks was, like his, was his was his old thing. So it's interesting, is this a forward or backward step from buses? I don't really know. Well, as but... I said, I think he's spending too much time in the country. Yeah. This so, Charlotte, what did you think? What do you think of the bangers and mash? Oh, yeah, that was one of the more normal bits, wasn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, I've really stuck on the cow conversation, to be honest. I'm, I'm fascinated. Um, he seems to... He seems to have a fair bit of time on his hands, but very insistent on the idea that he is working very hard in Uxbridge and obviously doing very well for himself. He's made a lot of speeches, made, what was it, a million pounds in six weeks, which is something so that I'm... So, Charlotte, you don't make that much money in six weeks without being very busy. Oh. I could... He is definitely very busy. Oh, what about yeah. the... Scarlett, what about the stuck-in-the-lift comment? Um, actually, I think he... Keep he's drawing, Scarlett. I... <laughs> You're a woman. He thinks I want. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think he's right. I think I think I, actually, one wouldn't mind being stuck in a lift with Boris Keir or Nicola Sturgeon. I think they're all quite really quite interesting. I, I mean, there are, as you know, some really boring politicians on all sides. I'm oh, not yes. picking sides, yeah. but actually, those three are fascinating. Um, and the thing about Boris is if he was stuck in a lift with anybody, he'd just spend the whole time trying to charm them. Well, one is, one is very charming, one is super intelligent, and one is just chippy. Chippy? Chippy Nicky. 
Really? Yeah. Oh, come on. I think I think I, I don't think, think you'd want to be lifted all three of them at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that might be you wouldn't get a, a word bit, in little, sideways, would you? <laughs> no, exactly. It might be a little bit too intense, even if it was for 50 floors. I think we're done, by the way, with but, our you know, the, the bit, comment I made at the beginning of the programme about Boris and, you know, he was kind of, a, I know, I felt bad, he was a bit hurt by it, but he doesn't, he is not a party animal, he does not do small talk in that way. So I think if you were stuck in a lift with him, it would be more difficult for him than it would for you. Unless they started a big political debate on, say, exactly, Brexit, for example. Exactly, exactly, unless nice you were way. talking about Brexit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK, do we see these cows? Let's talk about the cows. Well... Sebastian first. <laughs> Come on, hold it up. That's OK. I want to see all of them before I give marks out of ten. Oh, I think mine's the best. Charlotte, I think Charlotte's is the OK, best. so there is a definite winner here. <laughs> yeah, no, Charlotte is a winner. Even though it looks more like a pig, it is a winner. <laughs> um, Sebastian, yours... Yours... Look, yeah, where are the others, all of you? I, I, I put udders. I put udders. Oh, yeah, I can't see that. Far Mine's got a whole right. series of male cows. So I have udders. Technically, Scarlet wins. Uh, she's got creatively, udders. Creatively, <laughs> Charlotte wins. Sebastian, that looks like my 16-month-old granddaughter's <laughs> teddy. <laughs> so it's... Hang on, this cow's a male. This cow, your teddy, this like cow your teddy? is <laughs> very <laughs> offended by that and that your comparison. So, it may I'm look sorry. more like a dog, but I think it aspires <laughs> to be a cow. So if I had drawn one, I'd have just drawn something with a belt around it and would have called it a belted galway. Do you know, a little bit about cows. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most I've thought about cows in years. So. so can I ask you guys, can you sip the wine? What do you think of it? Did Perfect. you make this personally, Nadine? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do we have to be nice about it? <laughs> no. Oh, it's definitely wine. It was the wine of Baron Rothschild's wife, Nadine. Mm. Quickly? I'd, I'd say it's got a lot of depth to it. Some, yes. fruit, <laughs> some, some fruity notes. I've got to move on. I've got to go to something. <laughs> I'm sure you like it. This brings us to the end of my very first show. Thank you for joining me and thank you to my wonderful panel, all of you, Sebastian, Charlotte and Scarlett. I will remember this night forever. I'm back at 8pm next week for more Friday fun. We're off to the pub now. I think we've earned it. Cheers, everyone.